So you were just diagnosed with prostate cancer. What now? I'm Dr. Steve Tucker, medical oncologist. Let's talk about treatment for newly diagnosed prostate cancer. And we're gonna to talk today about early prostate cancer, which means not prostate cancer that's spread to the bone, but prostate cancer where someone's gonna speak with you about the treatment options, which includes surgery in all sorts of forms, radiation, many different techniques, hormone therapy, which is often combined with radiation, or what we call active surveillance with delayed or deferred intervention, which we used to call watchful waiting. Really, it's observation. It's an option that says, we might treat you, we just don't think we need to treat you this year. And that's a good choice for a lot of men as well. Now, what do we really need to do? You understand all those options and it gets very confusing what to do. But I'm gonna point out the very first step that should be taken after a prostate biopsy and a diagnosis of prostate cancer is a second opinion on the pathology. Patients often go through a lot of process to choose their surgeons for the biopsy, but nobody goes out and picks their own pathologist. The pathologist is critical because they are the only person in the chain that said you have prostate cancer. People often say, I say to the patients, who told you you had prostate cancer? The surgeon. Well, who told the surgeon? The pathologist. The pathologist is key. Everyone should get a second opinion on their prostate cancer pathology because there is a subjective element to this. And without getting too technical, you can see from the images behind me, we use something called a Gleason score created by Dr. Gleason. And in simple form, we look under the microscope twice and assign a score of one to five. And then we look again for secondary features and assign another score of one to five. So the lowest score is a two and the highest is a 10. Eight, nine, tens are considered high risk, less than six, six or less is lower risk and sevens are intermediate. This is gonna be important because that second opinion is really critical to helping put newly diagnosed patients into these risk groups. Now these risk groups are not risk of life or death. Prostate cancer treatment or observation, five years from, from diagnosis, 100% survival. Did you hear that? 100% survival. Stage one, two, three prostate cancers. Whether you do everything or nothing, 100% survival. Now, that said, prostate cancer treatments are strongly associated with side effects, including permanent side effects. Surgery and radiation will have problems with rectal bleeding, erectile function, sexuality, uh, urinary control. Uh, you, you might need to buy diapers. So there are permanent enduring problems with a lot of the prostate cancer treatments. Not that you shouldn't pursue those treatments, but you need to be aware that that's something that happens in trying to get cured. So what I ask patients to do is to take a step back and we put them into a risk group. And those risk groups, as I said, are low, intermediate, and high risk. Not risk of death, but risk that the PSA blood test will go from zero back to some measurable number years later. So let's think about this. The whole process started because the PSA blood test was elevated. And then after surgery, it goes to zero but maybe one or two years later, the PSA is going up again. How could that be? It means that there was prostate cancer cells somewhere outside of surgery or radiation that we couldn't get at the beginning. That's called a PSA relapse or a biochemical relapse. And if that's the case, I can help patients predict what are the odds that that could happen. So that's all based on the risk group. And the risk grouping is pretty straightforward. Low risk means your PSA is less than 10, your Gleason score is six or less by an expert, and that when we examine your prostate or look with MRI, it looks pretty normal. High risk, your PSA is more than 20, your Gleason score is an eight, nine, or 10 by an expert, or the tumor in the prostate is very big, what we call T3. Now, intermediates, are not low and they're not high. 
So it's a pretty clear system. But here's a caveat. To be a low risk in the low risk group, you need to have all of the low risk features. If you have a single high risk feature, a PSA of 22 and everything else great, you're still high risk. So one high risk feature and you're in the high risk group, all low risk features to be in the low risk group. Why does this matter? Low risk patients who go for surgery or radiation are overwhelmingly likely to be cured 10 years later. The chance of a PSA relapse is probably 10% or less. The flip side, if you're in a high risk group, the chance of PSA relapse in the first five years exceeds 50%. And if you have, count the number of biopsies that have cancer in it. So you might get 10 biopsies if seven have cancer in it, that also puts you in a high risk group. And having more prostate biopsies with cancer, even in the intermediate group, the chance of PSA relapse probably is 100% at five years. So putting patients into these risk groups is really critical to help decide how they wanna treat or manage prostate cancer. For example, if you are a very low risk patient, I might say something to those patients like, you're an excellent candidate for surgery or radiation in any form, but I might not recommend them because there's no survival advantage. You won't live longer, you'll live longer without a prostate, but you don't get a survival advantage in that case, but you get all the risks of doing surgery or radiation. Those patients, I think that observation or active surveillance is a good choice. The flip side, a high risk patient. I might say, John Doe is a high risk, newly diagnosed prostate cancer patient who could do surgery or radiation, but I don't recommend it because of the very high chance that his PSA will start going up right after surgery. And he might be an excellent candidate for say, hormones plus radiation, a combined treatment. And he wouldn't be a good candidate for observation. The intermediate cases are definitely more challenging, but we have to put all of this information in context of other disease. So a second opinion from say a cardiologist or a good family medicine doctor who knows you becomes critical because if you have diabetes, obesity, heart disease, a stent, a bypass, on dialysis or some other chronic disease or take medicine like chronic blood thinners, then radiation and surgery might not be good choices. It's really important that you don't rush into any decision making because the facts of the matter are we have multiple randomized clinical trials in prostate medicine that still don't show that surgery or radiation compared to observation or watchful waiting have a survival advantage for our patients. We know that the patients who take surgery or radiation are going to have more side effects, but the men on the observation arm don't have to suffer that risk. Now, they do have progressive prostate growth, prostate cancer growth, but they can do surgery or radiation later. The bottom line is, if you have chronic medical conditions, maybe those are more important than an early low risk prostate cancer. And when one of the legitimate options is observation, there's no rush to judgment. I get it. I'm a medical oncologist and talk to cancer patients every day. Cancer is the single most frightening word in any language. Cancer is an emotional emergency. It's not something that you have to run to the A&E and say, I need treatment right away. So take a deep breath, think about how you wanna be treated and what's gonna be best for you in the long run. And then you can start to make some logical decisions that'll be right for you. I'm Dr. Steven Tucker. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, leave them in the box below.